And we are live. How's everybody out there doing today? Can everybody hear me okay? We yeah, got some thumbs up. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin from the zoo's herpetology department. And we are live from the Herpetarium here at the St. Louis Zoo. I'm not alone. I am here with Mr. Mike, who is from the zoo's education department. And he's going to be reading some questions off for me that you guys have. So if you guys do have any questions throughout our webinar, feel free to type them in the chat below so that we can answer them for you. Um, because I am not alone and me and Mike are together, we're both going to be wearing masks this whole time. So that way we're, we're nice and safe. But uh, we, we are going to be, along with answering your questions, we're going to show you guys a tour of the Herpetarium and talk about a couple other things today too. And this is to celebrate World Snake Day, which was a week or so ago. But you know, it's never too late to celebrate these awesome animals that are snakes. Um, before we get started, where are you guys from? Go ahead and put in the chat where you guys are from so that we know where our audience is, is uh, tuning in from. Yeah, and let us know um, maybe how many people are in your group. It's always neat to know. Looks like all kinds of places. St. Louis, Memphis. Memphis, okay. Yeah, all over the place. Florissant, Missouri. Awesome. UK. UK. Oh, awesome. Welcome from across the pond. Yeah. Okay, guys. Um, so, again, my name is Justin, and I work here for the Zeus from Dollars Department. And we have a a lot of snakes here at the zoo, and along with taking care of snakes here at the zoo, we also do field work across the world to uh, help to make sure these animals are studied as well as preserved in their native habitats. We have a lot of different snakes that are on exhibit here at the zoo, and we're going to go ahead and start a video that talks about some of the different snakes that you can see if you come here to the zoo and come to the Herpetarium for a bit. So we'll go ahead and we'll start that up. Enjoy. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and share this video. It's uh, one that uh, is uh, Justin that we filmed together not too long ago. Uh, it takes a little tour. You might need to adjust your audio. So when it goes to play, um, it may be too loud or too soft. So go ahead and get ready to adjust your audio and I'll go ahead and cue it up here. Hey guys, so we're gonna be doing a tour of the Charles Hessel Herpetarium here at the St. Louis Zoo and looking at some of the different snake species that we have on exhibit. Worldwide, there's almost 3,000 different species of snake. Here in the Herpetarium, we have around 100 or so different species, many of which are venomous, some of which are on exhibit, some of which are not. Um, and there's so much diversity within snakes, and we figure what a better day to talk, talk about the diversity of snakes in the World Snake Day. So let's go take a look around and look at some of the different creatures we got here. The snake we're gonna look at is a very rare python species. This is the Bolens python. Bolens pythons are from the island of New Guinea, and New Guinea split into two different countries, Indonesia to the west and Papua New Guinea to the east. These guys live in the mountain range that goes across that island. Um, they live in a higher elevation. They're one of the most cold, uh, weather hardy python species on the planet because they live at such high elevation to help them adapt with that cool climate there's black color they're very pretty and there's a lot of different feeding strategies within snakes uh, we're going to talk about the venomous snakes and whatnot here in with the next couple animals but because pythons are a constrictor we're going to not only talk about constricting but we're going to actually show you guys so we're going to feed this guy so we feed all of our snakes a very well balanced diet that is reflective of what these guys eat in the wild so these guys in the wild they eat a lot of mammals a particular different possum species out of marsupials we're going to feed them this rat here um, and you can see the snake back there and it already this guy he can smell this rat you can see him moving around getting active we'll go ahead and and along with smelling, these guys have another really interesting sense, which is they can actually pick up on the heat signature of their prey. Yeah, so you see him, he's flicking his tongue out, and that is a uh, sensory organ they have. Their tongue actually is part of a very sophisticated sense of smell almost there we go so once they bite on and typically they'll bite on on the head 
they'll put a couple coils around and even though this rat is already dead typically they'll they'll wrap around it like that anyway just to to make sure 100 percent and they don't really understand the difference between you know whether or not something is alive or already killed there's a lot of myths out there people think that whenever snakes constrict around something they're breaking the bones or you know doing a variety of other things but that's not necessarily the case um, but we were talking about the Jacobson organ. So snakes, whenever they stick their tongue out like that, <clears throat> that's one way that they can smell kind of. I like to refer to it as smelling in 3D sort of kind of. What they're doing is they're sticking their tongue out, they're picking up particles in the air, bringing those back into their mouth and sticking the tongue into the roof of their mouth where they have these two little organs that pick up on those particles. And that combined with some snakes like some pythons being able to pick up on heat signatures of prey as well. It makes them incredibly effective predators. So within snakes, there's lots of different feeding strategies. The python we looked at earlier, for example, that is a constrictor. They constrict their prey to death. Venomous snakes use their venom to incapacitate their prey. So there's different kinds of venomous snakes. Black mambas, for example, are an elapid, which means they have a fixed fang. Other elapids are cobras, the other mamba species, different crates, king cobras. And then there are vipers and pit vipers, and they're the venomous snakes that have these fangs that can retract up into the top of their mouth. And that includes rattlesnakes, gaboon vipers, Armenian vipers and a variety of other different vipers from both the old and new world. Okay guys, the next snake we have is a very well-known snake. It's our black mamba. Black mambas are an incredibly venomous species of snake from Africa. They have a fairly wide distribution throughout the entire continent. Uh, we have one here on exhibit at the zoo that you guys can come see whenever you want. Uh, black mambas are incredibly fast, incredibly toxic, and they're very smart as well. So whenever we work these guys, we have to be you know, on our A game to make sure we're keeping ourselves safe as well as ensuring the uh, snakes are in good hands. Um, we'll talk a little more later about what tools and methods we use to work with venomous snakes, both here at the zoo as well as in the field whenever we're conducting field research for conservation purposes. Um, black mambas get the name black mamba not only because their coloration is black, but whenever they get scared, one thing they'll do is they'll put up almost like a cobra, not quite as you know, exaggerated as cobras have these really intricate hoods. And also open their mouth and the inside of their mouth is this deep, deep black, similar to my mask almost. Um, yeah, very, very cool snakes, very active snakes. These guys spend a lot of time climbing trees to get into bird nests, as well as a lot of time on the ground and grasses too. All right, guys, now it is World Snake Day and we are celebrating all of the cool snakes that live around the world. But this next animal we're gonna talk about, it's not actually a snake. This is a lizard. And a lot of people just assume that all legless lizards are snakes, but that's not true. Leglessness has actually evolved quite a few different times throughout reptiles. There's quite a few different species of lizard around the world that are legless. This one that we're gonna talk about is a European legless lizard or a Sheltapusic, and they're the largest species of legless lizard. And these guys live in Western Asia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and they live in a country where we do a lot of field work for conservation purposes, purposes, the country of Armenia. So if you look closely, you can see that this guy actually has eyelids. And snakes do not have eyelids. They have a scale that goes over their eye called a brill or an eye cap that helps to protect their eye. But they can't actually close their eyes like these guys can. And these guys also have this line going down their body like that. Snakes don't have that either. Along with, you know, these superficial external characteristics that make them different from snakes. There's a lot going on inside as well too. Their organs are very different. Their skeletal structure is very different. Yeah, very cool lizards. Um, these guys can get big. That last one I saw, for example, you know, that thing was around three foot. This is a smaller female. She's not quite that big. Very cool animals. These guys, they eat a lot of invertebrates in the wild. Uh, specifically, they really like snails. So these guys like escargot. We'll go ahead and we'll put him back and keep looking at snakes. 
Hey guys, so the next species of snake we're going to talk about is actually native to Missouri and the Midwest, and that is a copperhead. So here in Missouri, we have five different species of venomous snake. We have the copperhead, the water moccasin, and these guys are very closely related. And then we have the massasauga rattlesnake, the pygmy rattlesnake, and they're very closely related. And then we have the timber rattlesnake. Of these five species, the biggest is the timber rattlesnake. They can get well over, you know, three feet. Um, and the smallest would be the pygmy rattlesnake or the massasauga. Copperheads can get fairly big. They can get, you know, well, well within two feet, three feet or so. Uh, and they're also the most common. So these guys have a very wide range, not very specific to one type of habitat. They kind of like it all over the place as long as it's not too wet and not too dry. Um, throughout the state of Missouri, they have a pretty wide range. There's not many counties that these guys do not live in. And they're also one of the most well-known venomous snakes here in the state. Everybody knows copperheads. Uh, everyone you know, has seen them or knows someone that's seen them. And because they are so common, they also are the uh, species that bites the most people. Now, typically snakes, they're not gonna bite unless they're scared. Snakes are a defensive species. They don't want anything to do with people, much like many people don't want anything to do with snakes. So typically, as long as you're not messing with them and you're watching where you're putting your hands and putting your feet, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, even though copperheads do account for the most snake bites in the state, it's still not many, you know, overall compared to other parts of the world. Copperheads give live birth. Many species of snake, including all of our native venomous snakes, all give live birth. Uh, in fact, all of the pit vipers in the New World give live birth, with the exception of Bushmasters, which live in Central and South America. All of the venomous snakes, all of the, the moccasins, the copperheads, the rattlesnakes that we have here in Missouri, they're all pit viper species, which not a lot of people realize. But yeah, these guys are all pit vipers, meaning they have two heat sensing L'Oreal pits on the roof of their mouth, right near their nostrils, kind of. And just like very similar to the bull and spy that we looked at earlier that has a row of heat sensing pits, these guys can pick up on heat signatures that help them not only to locate warm blooded prey, but as well as locate accurate, good places for them to bask and thermoregulate properly. Okay guys, the next snake we're gonna look at is one of the most well-known snakes in the world. They've had movies made about them, they've had songs written about them, and that is the green anaconda. Green anacondas are from South America. They live in a variety of different habitats from the Amazon rainforest to wet seasonal grasslands in Brazil as well, all the way to some of the islands on the coast of the continent like Trinidad. These guys get huge, which is one of the reasons why they are so well known. They're actually the heaviest species of snake in the world, and they get really, really long too. They can get well over 15 feet. And these guys are a big aquatic predator. They spend a good chunk of their time in the water where they are also, you know, getting away from the elements. It gets really hot where these guys live, so it's a nice way to cool down, as well as using the water as a way to ambush prey. They eat a lot of different things. They can eat mammals that are, you know, really, really big, all the way down to small things. They give live birth. Females can have more than 30 babies at a time, and the babies are really, really small. So when these guys are born, they're not much bigger than a foot or so, and then they can grow up to animals that are well over 10 feet long pretty easily. Really cool snakes, and you can come and see our large green anaconda here at the zoo's herpetarium. Okay guys, the next snake we're gonna look at is the Armenian Viper. And Armenian Vipers are, as the name implies, from the country of Armenia, as well as some of the other nearby countries. If you don't know where Armenia is, that's totally fine. Not many people do, it's a very small country. It is in Western Asia, and it is bordered by the countries of Iran, Turkey, and Georgia. Um, the country of Armenia is a very mountainous country, and it is one of the global biodiversity hotspots. So the St. Louis Zoo's conservation branch, known as the Wild Care Institute, has been doing work in the country of Armenia, looking at Armenian vipers and other endangered species of reptile and amphibian. For over 10 years, we've been involved in field surveys that have helped to expand the boundaries of national parks, as well as have an up and running breeding facility that specializes in endangered reptiles and amphibians that will eventually be repatriated or released back into the wild. 
Armenian vipers, really cool little snakes. They live high up in the mountains. They're a really dark coloration with these really vibrant orange or dark red spots. Uh, they give live birth, just like most of the vipers in this region of the world. They prey on a variety of different things. So they eat birds, lizards, babies will actually eat invertebrates. And they are an endangered species, and through the Wild Care Institute and the work we do here in the herpetology department at the St. Louis Zoo, we're helping to make a difference for these animals and all the other species that are endangered and face extinction in the country of Armenia. All right, everyone, that includes our brief tour of the herpetarium here at the St. Louis Zoo. We took a quick look at some of the snake species that we have on exhibit here in the herpetarium. We have quite a few more that we did get to talk about, but you guys can come see them yourselves and learn all about them. We're going to go ahead and come back to our live feed. Thanks so much and have a great snake day. Hey guys, and we're back to live. I hope you guys enjoyed that quick tour of the Herpetarium, showing off some of our cool snakes that we've got here. And we are going to be taking questions from you guys. So if there's any questions you have about snakes, go ahead and put them in the chat now. Um, while you guys think of questions, we're going to talk about some other stuff real quick. And also, I, we have two questions that came in already. We're going to answer those real fast. Um, the question that we have is, uh, what should one do if you come in contact with a snake while you are hiking or walking? Should you stay still, run? What should you do? So if you come in contact with a snake out in the wild, chances are that snake is much more scared of you than you are of it. And a lot of people find that hard to believe because a lot of people are really scared of snakes. Um, but if you come across a snake in the wild, like if it's on a trail or something, turn around, go the other way, and if you come back, chances are it'll be gone after a while. If it still is in the way, you know, feel free to go maybe six to ten feet out away from the snake and then back on the trail up ahead. Um, but in general, snakes are really, really defensive and very scared animals. They don't really want anything to do with people. Typically, interactions with people don't end well for snakes. So they perceive humans as these big, scary predators, just like how we perceive them as very scary animals. So as long as you just leave the animal alone, go the opposite direction, it's going to work out well for you. It's going to work out well for the snake, too. The next question we have is, how do snakes shed their skin? So snakes shed their skin similar to how we shed our skin. And that might seem weird, but uh, humans, just like all animals, we all shed our skin all the time, right? Um, humans and most mammals and whatnot, we do it in one way where lots of little skin cells are coming off throughout the day, every day. Snakes and a lot of other reptiles that build shed their skin either all at once or in patches in the case of many lizards. Uh, when snakes do shed their skin, when it's time for them to go through a shed cycle, the outer layer of skin will slowly come attached from the present layer of skin and a liquid like uh, sub substance builds up between the two layers of skin that helps them to rub that off and lubricate the skin and off. And this works whenever uh, whenever the snakes are growing and you know they outgrow their skin. That's one time that they'll show their skin and baby snakes typically show more often than adult snakes do. Another reason for this is out in the wild, there's lots of parasites that really like to eat snakes, like ticks and mites and things like that. And by shedding their skin, they get rid of all those parasites. So um, while we wait for you guys to turn in some more questions, we are going to talk about some different tools. So here at the zoo, we have lots of snakes, many of which are venomous, like we talked in the video, talked about in the video. And we have a variety of different tools that we use to make sure we are safe as well as the snake. So the first tool that we use whenever we need to move a snake around is this guy here. This is called a snake hook. You guys can see that okay? And this is our most often used tool to move snakes around. How this works is there's a handle down here, and there's this little hoop pin down here. And we will wait for the snake to be in a position where we can safely scoop it up like this, and we'll hook him from one place to another. And usually what we do here at the zoo is if we have to clean the enclosure out, we'll move the snake and put it into a locking container, and then we can get in the cage without the snake there, and we don't have to worry about it potentially buying us, and the snake's in a nice safe place, and it works out great for everybody. Another tool we use is this here. 
And these are called snake toms. And we don't use these um, often for moving snakes. So it's got a trigger there, it's got a grip there. And we don't use these for moving snakes around very often. More often than not, what we use these for is if we are going to beat a snake. So like you saw in the video with the bullet spy hunt, I was using a pair of forceps to hand the rope to that bullet spy hunt. These are very similar to those that we can hand food to snakes. So we can also use these to move water pools if we need to clean them or you know, take out cage furnishings too. Then the last tool we have is this, and this clear tube, these come in a variety of different sizes for a variety of different snakes, and this is called a snake tube. And we never put our hands on a venomous snake unless the head of the snake is safely restrained in one of these. So how we do this is we typically use a combination of all the tools that I just showed you. We use the tongs to hold the tube, so that way our hands are nice and far away from that snake. And then we use the snake hook to gently kind of push the snake and move his head in the direction of this tube. And once the snake has moved his head about halfway or so up the tube, we can safely put our hands on the snake's body while the snake's head is restrained in this tube. And the only time we would ever have to do this is for a medical procedure to get a physical on the animal or whenever we are in a uh, place doing field work like you saw in the video of our mania, sometimes we need to put our hands on wild snakes so we can get data on these animals that helps us to understand the populations of these animals in the wild, which helps us to better know how to protect them. So these are all the tools that we use for handling specifically venomous snakes on a regular basis. And from there, we're going to jump to our questions. Uh, Mike, in the back, he's going to be asking the questions and I'll be answering them. From here. All right, you've uh, quite a few questions are pouring in here, all kinds of good questions, and we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, start down the list and then see what we can answer. Some of them are about the animals we saw in the video. Awesome. So the first one, um, we're, uh, we'll see if we can answer, and we'll do it live here, is uh, what is the green anaconda's favorite food? So the green anaconda, in the wild, green anacondas, like I said in the video, they eat a lot of different stuff. They'll eat different crocodilian species, um, they'll eat fish sometimes, they'll eat turtles, they'll eat capybara, which are a very large rodent species. But here at the zoo, our anaconda eats pigs, actually. We get pigs in, um, that, again, all the food that we feed to our snakes, it's, it's killed before we get it here humanely, and that's her favorite food. Um, she's the only snake in our collection who will eat pig. So, everybody likes pig. <laughs> Great question. Um, good question here is, uh, and it related to this one, you can answer this one. I've been asked this many times. What would you consider, and they use the word biggest snake in the world? So the biggest snake in the world, it depends on if you mean by the length of the snake or the weight of the snake. The biggest snake in the world by weight would be the green anaconda. Green anacondas can get incredibly heavy. Um, they get well over 250 pounds. The longest snake in the world would be the reticulated python, which is a species from Southeast Asia. And these guys get really big. They can get well over 15 feet. There's accounts of them getting to be over 20 feet, but we're you know, often a little skeptical about any account of snakes that are over 18 feet or so, just because they're very, very rare, especially nowadays. Uh, but green anacondas and reticulated pythons, even though they live on very in different sides of the planet, they're similar in a lot of ways. They both are ambush predators. They both spend a lot of time in the water um, with an emphasis on anacondas who are semi aquatic. And they're both constricted species. So, while we're on the topic of uh, anacondas, we have two questions that are pretty similar related to it. And I thought we'll group them together. Um, do you know about how old our green anaconda is and um, how good is their eyesight? So, snakes in general have a really good, they, they have very good vision, but it's very different from us. It works really well for what snakes do, and that is hunt, ambush, you know, get prey, and find places that they can hide and bask. But they are really good at seeing things, and along with having other senses, like being able to, you know, use their, their Jacobson organ with their tongue to kind of see in 3D, like I talked about in the video. There's also some species being able to pick up on heat signatures. They have a really amazing array of senses they use to you know, do all the things that they need to do to stay happy and healthy in the wild. As far as the age of our anaconda here at the zoo, we don't know how old she was uh, or how old she is. 
Green anacondas can live to be well over 20 years old if left alone out in the wild. Um, and our green anaconda actually came from the wild. She came from South America. We often, most of the animals that we have here in the zoo, they are captive bred and, you know, producing captivity. Um, but sometimes, you know, opportunities arise where we will have animals that come from the wild. In the case of our green anaconda, she was actually in a food market in South America. So we ended up getting her and getting her out of that food market and she came here where she lives now and acts as an ambassador for not only green anacondas but snakes in general as well as the Amazon rain. Well, thank you. That's, uh, I think people enjoy the information about uh, one of our animals here. Awesome. So there's quite a few questions about venomous snakes. Okay. Um, so we'll start with something kind of broad. So in your opinion, what would you rank? What would be the most venomous snake either here at the zoo or, or in the world? So it, it's difficult to really say which species of snake is the most venomous. The way that scientists typically rank venom in snakes, it, it doesn't necessarily work well when you compare that to uh, being bit by a snake as a, as a human. Here at the zoo, we have a variety of different snake species that are very toxic, and there's different schools of thought that kind of determine you know, how venomous a snake is, and that is how toxic is the venom, and how much venom is injected in a bite. And large snakes, just because they are large, they have large venom glands, right? So Bushmasters, which are from Central and South America, some of the large rattlesnakes, they're big snakes, they have really big venom glands, so you're getting a lot of venom. Uh, along with that, that venom is very toxic with both those groups of snakes. And then you have other snakes, like some of the different cobras, where they're smaller, uh, and therefore the venom glands are smaller, but that venom drop per drop is very, very toxic. So some of the most venomous snakes around the world include mambas from Africa, including the black mamba that we talked about in the video. They just drop right around their venom is incredibly toxic. There's a species of cobra from Western Asia called a Caspian cobra. They are one of the most toxic cobra species in the world. Uh, very deadly animals that they were to bite you. Um, the often regarded as the most venomous snake drop for drop would be some of the tithans or deer snakes that are from Australia. And these guys are very toxic because they live in a very remote and rugged, difficult to traverse habitat. And they don't get any opportunities to come across prey. So they've evolved to be very, very toxic in order to, you know, kill prey really quick just because they don't know when the next time they're going to come across so they can eat. That being said, uh, snakes in general are defensive. They, you know, even though there's a lot of these really venomous animals out there, they don't want to use it on us people. They want to use it on things that they eat. So they want to use it on rodents and, you know, other snakes in some cases, like the king cobra. King cobra is going to name king cobra because they're the king of the snakes, right? They eat other snakes, including big python species. So they don't want to bite us, um, even though a lot of these animals are really toxic and they could, in fact, give us a bad time if they don't Cool. So a couple interesting questions, make it a little more personal. What is your favorite snake? Was my favorite favorite snake? snake. Uh, my favorite species of snake would be the yellow blotched palm pit viper. It is a small green pit viper species from Guatemala, as well as parts of Mexico. It lives high up in the mountains in cloud forests, and it is a beautiful little snake. They're very rare and they're an endangered species. That's, that's my favorite species. I also like Armenian vipers a lot too. If you couldn't tell in the video when I was talking about Armenian vipers, I get really excited. That's because they're a beautiful snake. The fact that we're able to help these guys in the wild is, is amazing. So quick question. We had uh, several about uh, copperhead, which we had in the video, I'm talking about copperheads. Okay. Um, do copperheads make it up to Maine? Can you find copperheads in Maine? Do copperheads make, I believe there's a small portion um, I'm trying to, so, I, so copperheads are very common in parts of the Northeast, but I don't believe they make it to Maine. Um, in Pennsylvania, they're very common, and especially in parts of the Appalachian Mountains around there, but I think Maine's a little too far north for copperheads. If you drive a little further south, there's copperheads, but where you guys, and so if you're from Maine, I don't believe there's copperheads. They, they're made historically, but I, I don't think that's the case. So, a couple different questions going back to venom. Um, so how is venom made? Um, a lot of people have asked questions about venom. 
Yeah, so venom is, is produced in glands in the uh, roof of the mouth of the snake, um, or more towards the back of the head, kind of. Um, some of the venomous vipers and pit vipers, they kind of have a triangular shaped head, and that part of the reason for that is towards the back of the jaw. That is where the venom glands are. And it's these glands, and they produce venom similar to the way that we produce saliva in our mouths, but it is more focused and centralized to those glands to then be injected through their teeth whenever they bite the prey. But it's made in their bodies. They, they have everything in them to make their own venom. Um, it's not like some of the different frog species from Central and South America that they have to eat a toxic ant or a termite in order to secrete a toxin. Snakes make their venom themselves and their venom comes. So a career question would be, um, which was asked, what would you tell an inspiring herpetologist? How, how did you get involved? So if you're interested in getting into the field of herpetology, um, whether it be in a zoo setting or doing lab work or field work or something, first and foremost, do, do go to school, you know, try really hard, not only through, uh, through high school and through grade school, but once you get into college, you, know, you definitely need to go to college and study either zoology or biology or something similar. Um, most university programs that have biology or, or specifically zoology programs, they will have herpetology courses. And there's some universities that have a very focused track on herpetology and they have large labs doing field work um, and a variety of other things. So study hard, go to school, uh, always be learning, always be trying to find out new things and learn as much as you can in your own time along with, you know, when you're in school, but Reading books about herbs, that's a great way to get into this stuff. And whenever you get old enough and you can, volunteer or intern at facilities. So here at the San Luis Zoo, for example, we have internship programs where people who are interested in herpetology, they can come and kind of get their foot in the door and get their feet wet and learn more about this field and work with animals. And that works out great because not only can people see if they're interested in wanting to work with herbs and, herbs and reptiles and amphibian snakes, in a zoo setting, or if, you know, they would be more apt to work for a university or for a governmental agency or something like that. But um, definitely doing good in school, interning or volunteering, and just learning as much as you can, that'll get you far. And it can be hard sometimes, don't give up. If it's something you really want to do, you'll, you'll make it happen, work hard, study hard, make it happen. I believe you. Excellent. So uh, a question, um, from a couple of different people, um, and it's a neat question. Um, why do so many snakes eat mice or rats or rodents? So a lot of snakes eat rodents um, because rodents are very plentiful, right? So out in nature, there are lots of mice just because they're a very abundant mammal. They have a lot of babies at a time. They can live in a variety of different habitats, right? So if you go out in the woods, you can find um, different kinds of rodents. If you're in a city setting, you can find rodents. If you're in a tropical rainforest or in the desert, you can find rodents. They're very, very common. So that's why a lot of snakes eat these guys. Uh, but actually, in the wild, especially when it comes to different pit vipers that we've talked about, these snakes eat a lot of other reptiles as well as amphibians more so than rodents. They'll eat frogs, they'll eat lizards, um, and some snakes are eating a variety of other things, like I mentioned earlier, king cobras eat other snakes, and there's other species of snake all over the world that specialize in eating snakes as well. So in Australia, there's different python species that eat snakes. Here in the United States, we have a king snake, which is a non-venomous colubrid, and uh, they eat you know a variety of snakes, including copperheads as well as rattlesnakes. Uh, in in zoos, we feed rodents pretty regularly because a lot of snakes eat them, and it's easy for us to get rodents too. So you had talked about in the video a little bit about reproduction with snakes. Um, the question um, that was asked is, do snakes lay eggs? And so we know obviously some do, but could you talk about different kinds of snake reproduction? Yeah, so there's there's three different kinds of ways that snakes uh, give birth in different ways, right? So there's laying eggs, and everyone's aware of that, right? A lot of different snakes lay eggs. And then there's getting live birth. And there's two different ways that snakes get live birth. There is uh, some snakes like boas, like boa constrictors, 
they will give birth to a snake, but it's in a very thin membrane. And the snake will, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a pseudo egg sort of kind of, and the baby snakes, they will hang out in this membrane for hours up to maybe even a day or so before they emerge from that case, like an egg where they'll be in that egg for, you know, often over a month before they hatch. And then there's live birth, which is completely, you know, the, the baby snake, uh, leaves the mom's body and is ready to go off on its own right away. So, uh, yeah, those are the three different ways that snakes give birth. And interesting enough, some snakes are parthenogenic, which is a fancy fancy word that means basically a snake can reproduce without a male. Um, there's a variety of different snakes that can do this, uh, and it's not not just snakes, but reptiles in general can produce parthenogenically. It's really interesting. So I got a keeper related question. Keeper related uh, question, awesome. Which I thought would be neat. Um, so do you care for venomous neonates a little any different than in an adult? Yeah, so with with baby vipers and baby snakes in general, there's a lot of different things you have to do that you wouldn't necessarily you know, do the same thing with the adult. In general, you uh, have to be a lot more careful with them because they are very small and very delicate. So they are prone to drying out and stuff. So we have to, along with giving them a water bowl where they can go and choose to drink water whenever they want, <clears throat> we will use a pump spray or something to mist on them and allow for, you know, a condensation layer kind of to build up around them so they can drink from that whenever they want to. We offer them food a little more often too because they are growing, they need a lot of calories. So we'll feed them roughly twice as often as we would need an adult saying It depends on the species. But in general, we'll feed them about twice as often. And yeah, other than that, you know, we're, we're keeping them basically the same as the adults. We're just keeping track of some of these little details a little because they are babies, they are delicate, and you know, we want to make sure they can we're going to be big and strong. So we have a couple more questions we'll we'll try to answer here before we wrap up tonight. Um, do you participate in any SSP programs? And you know, explain what an SSP program is. Yeah, so an SSP is a species survival plan and the uh, ACA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, has a variety of these different programs to ensure that the genetics of our animals in captivity are as strong as they can potentially be. So it acts kind of like a dating service for animals in zoos. And often it, it means that, you know, an animal from one zoo will have to go another Zoo to breed, and then those babies can be divided up, out amongst institutions. And I personally, I have the uh, program for the Green Anaconda. So I talk about Green Anacondas a lot because I really like them because I work a lot with that program. And you know, I, I do a lot of computer work and you know, crunch the numbers to make sure the genetics of our Green Anacondas in zoos here in North America are as diverse as they they're, they're very. There's a lot of really successful programs. Um, one of the oldest SSPs that zoos have is the uh, Aruban Island Rattlesnake. It was started in the early, early 80s. And it's a very successful program that along with doing the stud book portion, which is kind of like the dating service for these snakes in zoos, it also has a field component that is studying these animals as well too. And the Armenian vipers that we have here at the zoo, we have a stud book for those as well, and along with an SSP that ties into the field work that we do over in Armenia. So as we start wrapping up for tonight, um, how are um, our local snake populations doing? So you said, talked about SSPs of conservation. Yeah, so local snakes, it depends on what species, it depends on where you're at. So in certain parts of Missouri, the St. Louis area here, there's a certain place that you can go and there's lots of snakes and lots of different species. In other places, there may not be a variety of species that there historically once was, and that's due to Habitat destruction, uh, roadways being put in, things like this. Um, in general, we do have healthy populations of snakes. For example, here in Forest Park, you know where the zoo is located, we have some snakes that live here in the park, including uh, decayed brown snakes, black rat snakes, and a really cool snake that is called a lined snake that is typically associated with briar delay type habitat. We have those here, not only in Forest Park, but across the street in Dogtown as well. They're very common. They've adapted very well to an urban lifestyle. A lot of snakes, they, they aren't able to do this. If you put a subdivision up or a road or something, 
in our habitat are not going to do well, and eventually the population is going to disappear. But uh, we do have some endangered species of snake here in Missouri and in the Midwest, for example. Uh, in the Midwest, we have a snake called an eastern Massasauga. We have a closely related Massasauga rattlesnake in Missouri called western Massasauga. The eastern Massasauga, in particular, is a federally listed endangered species. Uh, there's some populations of them in Illinois and up in Michigan, but they're not doing very well because they rely on one specific habitat to live, and that is a wet meadow prairie type habitat. And there's just not a whole lot of that stuff left anymore. Um, and yeah, but other than that, in general, we have a lot of healthy populations of snakes, and it kind of depends on where you go and what you're what you're looking at. But you know, we, we do have lots of snakes around. And we're probably not going to get to uh, all the questions tonight, but we've spent a lot of time answering questions. So hopefully we answered a good handful of everybody's questions. You asked awesome questions tonight. Um, but I did want to answer this one because I, I get lots of questions about cotton mouse. Um, and, and the question um, would be, when it comes to venomous snakes, what would you consider the most venomous snake in Missouri or one that we would worry about? The most venomous snake in Missouri would probably be the timber rattlesnake, and that is because their venom is very toxic, and they can get very big and produce a lot of venom at a time. Uh, the cotton mouths that we have in the southern portion of the state, they also can be very toxic too, and you know, just like the timbers, <coughs> they have very large venom on because they can get big. So these guys, they're, they're, they're fairly toxic, and it's not something that you want to mess with. And again, though, uh, these snakes, they don't want anything to do with people, right? If you leave them alone, they're going to leave you alone. And both the timber rattlesnake and the cottonmouth, they do a really good job of letting you know that they don't want anything to do with you. Uh, timber rattlesnakes, just like all rattlesnakes for the most part, they have a rattle. And that's their way of saying, hey, I'm right here, I'm rattling my tail, letting my presence be known. If you get too close to me, I'll bite you. I don't want to bite you. I'd rather use my venom on a squirrel or a chipmunk or something. You know, you stay over there. I'm going to let you know that I'm right here. And cottonmouths, one of the reasons that cottonmouths get that name is because when they feel threatened, they open their mouth up and they just sit there and they show you their venom glands on the roof of their mouth. And the inside of their mouth is this deep white coloration. And that's where the cottonmouth name comes from. And that's their way of saying, Hey, I've got venom glands. I'm right here. That white color typically, you know, really jumps out. Oh, well, on, like if you're looking at an animal that's a leaf litter or where these guys live in swamps and stuff on that being stuff, it's just a big white blur. And that's a really good way for them to let you know that, hey, I'm right here, leave me alone. Um, yeah, but, but that being said, they are both incredibly toxic animals if you're the So I, I wanted to um, answer some more questions about our snake collection. If we could answer some, uh, we had quite a few um, since it's a kind of a tour yeah, yeah. Uh, webinar. Um, about how many species would you say are here snake wise at the zoo? So we have around 100 or so different species of snake here. Not all of them are on exhibit. We do have a really nice variety of snakes that are on exhibit for the public to come see and learn about. But we do have some species that are on exhibit for different reasons. Either they're very shy or they just do better in places where we can keep them. You know, a little more private and secluded. Um, that being said, one of the reasons we have, you know, some snakes that are off exhibit is because, along with acting as a place for people to come look at different snake species and other animals and learn about them, we do a lot with conservation programs, whether that be breeding them here at the zoo and, you know, some fact to keep them in areas that are off exhibit to do that. And we do different research projects here to learn more about these snakes and the best ways that we can keep them in zoos. So, but yeah, we have around roughly 100 or so species, many of which are venomous, if not most of which are venomous. Okay. Um, another uh, question about our snake collection here, um, what would be your oldest snake that you're aware of here at the zoo? The oldest snake we have is a bull python. And ball pythons are very common in uh, pet shops and in people's, you know, uh, collections at home. They're, they're a really good pet snake. They don't get big. They're really relaxed. They, they do well as a pet. So we often in zoos, we don't have them because, you know, they're, they're well represented in, in that side of things. But we do have a ball python that has been here at the zoo for a really long time. She's actually been here in the Herbitarium since the 1950s. So 
she is really old. Um, and at this point, you know, we're, we're giving her the best possible life that she can get because she is an old air animal. But that being said, she's in great shape. <laughs> she's almost in as good a shape as, you know, most of the ball pythons that you would see at a pet shop. She's in great shape. She's doing great. She's lived to be much older than we thought that they could live to be. So, yeah. So there's uh, another question I thought we could jump to because it's a Pretty interesting question, and I think people enjoy hearing a little bit more about this. What kind of diseases are snakes susceptible to and stuff that you've come? How can you tell if a snake has a disease, whether you have one as a pet or something in the wild or at the zoo? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different diseases that snakes get, um, some of which are similar to the diseases that we get. Uh, snakes can get respiratory infections that are similar to like kind of like a common cold or a flu that people get. Um, there are this is a whole of parasites, and a lot of wild snakes, like I mentioned, we are talking about snakes shedding their skin. A lot of snakes in the wild, they will get parasites both internal and external, and they're getting things outside of their body, like mites and ticks and things like that. And they're getting things inside, like tapeworms and things like this. Um, there is, for example, one really weird disease that snakes can get is called Ophidiomyces, and the common name for this is snake fungal disease and snake fungal disease is a fungal infection on the snake's skin and sometimes they can shed it off and get rid of it and uh, though they'll, they'll still be infected with it it doesn't affect their day-to-day -day life right but other times especially with different pit viper species that we have here in the United States it hits them really really hard so there's a variety of different diseases that they get opidiomyces is one that you know, we're really scared of in the herpetology world because it can wreak havoc upon different populations of snakes. But in general, a lot of times, you know, snakes can have them make a load of it. Okay. So I have a fun question. I think I know the answer, but I think you'd be a better one to answer this. Um, are there any snakes that care for their young or in any way care for the young? So a lot of snakes will care for their young in different ways. There's no snakes that will feed their young or nurse them, you know, similar to like mammals do and whatnot. But uh, often people, when they think of snakes, they think that the, the mom lays the eggs and leaves, or the snake you know, gives birth and leaves. But there are examples of parental care. For example, different python species, they will guard their eggs. So reticulated pythons, different carp python species, and a variety of other python species, they'll lay eggs. The female will sit with those eggs and protect them along with incubate them by contracting their muscles to create heat to keep them warm. Um, and if you try to take the eggs from the snake, they get really defensive because they're protecting them. Other species of snakes, such as different rattlesnakes and Armenian vipers and their close relatives, after the snake has given birth, the female will often wait with the babies until the babies have shed their skin. Uh, all snakes typically, they'll either hatch from the egg or they're born in a shed cycle. And not long after they're born or hatch, they will go through a shed and you know, shed off that skin that they had either inside the egg or inside the womb. And a lot of the different, like, like I said, vipers and rattlesnakes, that they will wait with those baby snakes and protect them. Um, Timber rattlesnakes that we have here in the Midwest that we talked about quite a bit already, they're really great parents. Um, the females will wait with baby rattlesnakes, sometimes for months at a time. And they won't necessarily protect them, but they will kind of sit there and act as a, uh, you know, if, if a predator were to come, they're going to defend themselves along with the babies. And sometimes timber rattlesnakes, different females will hang out together with babies that will kind of hang out with each other's babies, not just their own. So very interesting stuff. We're still learning quite a bit about the social lives of snakes. Uh, it's not really something that we have been studying for that long. So it's, it's very exciting to look into these different social aspects of their life. So I, I thought we would, as we get closer to the end here, um, this is a question that comes up a lot um, in education. It comes up a lot around the zoo. Um, and I thought it might be something fun to talk about. And there's a bunch of questions related to it. Um, so about being bitten by a snake. Uh -huh. um, one, have you ever been bitten by a snake? Um, and then what, you, what should you do? If you got, whether it's venomous or non-venomous, what, 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 how would you answer that? So if you are bitten by a venomous snake, the first thing you do is get to a hospital. Um, 
the local hospitals in this area, they typically will carry an antivenom for our local venomous snakes, and uh, if need be, they can administer it to you. Um, but first and foremost, you, you need to get to a hospital. There's nobody that is better suited to treat a venomous snake bite than a physician at a hospital. That's what you need to do. Um, if you are far away from a hospital, in the meantime, you know, drink lots of fluids. Uh, there, there's a variety of different like things that you can buy in a store, like suction kits and tourniquets and whatnot. Those really don't do anything for snake bites. Um, so we, we don't really recommend those. But in, in short, you know, a lot of drinking water, if you have water, but get out of there as soon as you can and get to a hospital. Don't try to kill the snake. Don't try to hurt the snake. You're just gonna, you know, end up getting bit again or getting somebody else bit. Um, all the antivenom for snakes in this area, at least, it, the antivenom for one species of copperhead or moccasin is gonna be the same for a rattlesnake. It's the same stuff. So just get to the hospital and get that bite treated. If you can't take a picture of the snake, but again, venomous snake bites are so uh, rare, you know, for how many people are out there walking around in the habitat of venomous snakes all the time, there's very few venomous snake bites that happen. And the vast majority of snake bites that do occur are because people are messing with snakes, right? So people see a snake and they either try to kill it or try to move it or something, and in the process, they ask them to get it. Accidents do happen sometimes, you know, a snake's in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they don't get an opportunity to, you know, warn you, like, hey, I'm over here. And sometimes people step on snakes, sometimes people like to put their hands on snakes, and in, in one of those cases, you know, get, get to a hospital soon. Excellent. Uh, and if it's a non-venomous snake, is there anything you'd recommend, you know, it's non-venomous snake, guard or snake, or? As far as if you get bit by it? Yeah. Yeah, so non-venomous snakes, um, if you get bit by it, clean it, clean the wound, right? Um, Non-venomous snakes are typically the only way you're going to get bit by one of those is if you put your hands on it, uh, because a lot of our non-venomous snakes are very fast. And they're just trying to get away from you, you know, as quick as they can. Unlike some of the pit vipers that we have that are a little bigger and a little sluggish, and often they'll, you know, sit in one spot and warn you about their presence rather than hoping that you get away from them. But if you are bit by a non-venomous snake, like a rat snake or a water snake or something, Clean the bite off really good. Use some antibacterial soap and use tap water, um, and yeah, you should you should be fine. So I thought for our last question to kind of wrap up tonight, I thought this would be a fun question for you. Okay. Um, and, and, you, and you might need to explain a little bit, but have you ever been mussed by handling non-venomous snakes? And what, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, so a lot of different snake species, um, even venomous snakes, well, non-venomous snakes, they secrete a musk, and that is their way of making a nasty fluid that smells really bad, and I'm assuming tastes really bad too. I don't have any experience with that. And that's their way of you know trying to you know convince a would-be predator that this isn't something that they want to eat. You know, if, if you lost your appetite because something smells really bad or tastes really bad, you're not going to try to eat it. Uh, so snakes have musk glands. There's some snakes from Asia that have musk glands on the neck. Those are really interesting, but the vast majority of snakes have musk glands towards the back of their tail, um, near their cloaca. And snakes, rather than having multiple holes to do multiple things, they have one hole in their body that acts for reproduction as well as waste. And that is where the musk glands are. So some snake species, is they get musk, they'll uh, actually divert the musk gland out and spray it all over the place. Um, some of them just they secrete it out. And yeah, I've been musk quite a few times. I was musk today. I, I, normally, we, we get musk pretty regularly at work. We wear gloves whenever we put our hands on snakes. And part of that is for you know to limit uh, potential disease transfer. So if an animal would be sick and we didn't know it, we don't want to transfer it to another animal. And another part of it is because you know we don't want to get musk out to just take the gloves off from away. It's not that musk on us. Uh, venomous snakes can musk just like non-venomous snakes. In fact, some of the worst smelling musk is from venomous pit viper species. So along with being venomous and you know being able to warn you that they're venomous, they can actually musk too before they even you know show you their fangs or scratch each other. Good question. Yeah, very good question. And then for our, our last question tonight, um, and this is one that I, I get asked a lot too, but 
how often do our snakes eat? So I know it may differ between snakes, but kind of tell uh, everybody for some of the different snakes, how often do we feed our snakes here at the zoo? So it depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the species of snake. It depends on the time of year. And it depends on the age of the snake. Um, all of our snakes at the zoo typically eat at least one to two times a month. Um, there's some snakes that we have that eat much more often than that. They might eat four, five, or even six times a month. Again, it depends. So some species are uh, ambush predators and have a very slow metabolism. And if they eat too often, they can't get sick. Um, so we will feed them a little less. And then there's other snakes that have higher metabolisms. They're, they're fast snakes, they're active hunters, they're all over the place. And these guys we need to feed a little more often. But all of our snakes will eat at least once or twice a month. Uh, baby snakes, like I mentioned earlier, we'll feed them a little more just because they are growing. And you know, the more calories you can get into them, the better, especially during those you know, initial stages of their life when they're growing. And all righty. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up for tonight. Um, thank you guys for uh, coming and listening tonight, learn a little bit about what's going on here at the Herpetarium. And Justin, thank you for taking your time and talking to everybody about some yeah. of the neat species we, we have here. Um, yeah. So uh, please tune in for some of our other uh, upcoming different webinars that we'll be doing in the future. And hopefully everybody enjoy. Thank you guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.